Well, the concept of reinvention of self <clears throat> is a concept in neuroscience that everybody's beginning to understand as a possibility. Um, so let's talk about this concept called mental rehearsal, and then we'll talk about how it applies to quantum physics. Okay? In other words, if we believe that our thoughts have something to do with our destiny, how does subjective mind have an effect on the objective world? How does subjective mind produce measurable, intentional, objective changes in physical reality? So, they did an experiment a little ways back where they took a pe group of people who pretty much never played the piano before. They divided them into four different categories. In the first group of people, they said, listen, we're going to teach you these one-handed uh, finger exercises, scales and chords. We want you to come every day for two hours a day for five days. You practice these scales and chords. We're going to do a functional brain scan of your brain before. We're going to do a functional brain scan of your brain afterwards. And we're going to see if you've actually grown new circuits. Now, functional brain scans are like a motion picture of the brain. Regular CAT scans and MRIs are like a snapshot of the brain. We're looking for anatomy. We're looking for broken parts. We're looking for missing parts, injuries. But a functional scan allows us to see the brain in action or to see the brain at work. And whenever we study the brain in action, the brain at work, that's called mind. Mind is what the brain does. So they said, okay, to the first group, come and play the scales and chords every single day. And after we do the scan, we want to see if you've grown any new circuits. So the people came and played every single day. And after five days, of course, they grew a whole new set of circuits on the opposite side of their brain. Well, that makes sense. If you learn something new, learning's making new connections. You get some instructions. The instruction is to apply what you've learned to, to the learn how process, to get your body involved, which your mind is intellectually understood. You're going to reinforce those circuits. If you pay attention and you repeat it over and over again, you're going to absolutely grow new circuits. That's how we grow circuits. So these people grew a measurable amount of circuits in the opposite side of the brain. Second group of people, they said, come for two hours a day for five days. We'll scan your brain before, we'll scan your brain after. But listen, you come and play whatever you want. And at the end of five days, hardly anything happened. Why? Because they didn't get any knowledge, so they didn't make any new connections. They got no instruction. They couldn't repeat what they did the day before because they couldn't remember. And of course, they couldn't pay attention. So there was no template or no map for them to follow uh, to reinforce circuitry. The repetition, but, but the, the template starts out with learning, right? If you learn the scales and chords, then if you apply what you learn and you get some instruction, now that process is an experience, and the experience shapes the brain. So the third group of people, they said, don't even show up. And, of course, there was no change in their brain at all. In other words, don't learn anything new, don't do anything differently, and your brain doesn't change. <clears throat> the last group of people, they said, come for two hours a day for five days. We'll scan your brain before, we'll scan your brain after. But listen, what we want you to do is we want you to close your eyes and we want you to mentally rehearse playing the scales and chords. At the end of five days, they grew the same amount of circuits as the people who physically demonstrated the activity. Now, that was uh, a monumental experiment because it showed that we can change our brain just by thinking differently. And not only that, when we're truly focused and we're truly paying attention, because of the size of the frontal lobe, the brain does not know the difference between what's happening out there and what's happening in here. In other words, the thought becomes the experience in and of itself when we're truly focused. Now, why is that? Well, the frontal lobe is kind of like the volume control of the brain. It makes up 40% of our entire brain, largest in human beings and any other species. And it's the seat of our our free will. It's where we invent. It's when we speculate. It's when we pay attention, when we plan, when we remember, when we make decisions. It's the CEO of the brain. It's the symphony leader of the brain. But when we're learning or when we're paying attention or when we're planning and we're deciding, we don't want to be distracted by any other extraneous stimuli. So the frontal lobe literally lowers the volume to time and space. It literally lowers the volume to the feedback from the environment, the feedback from our body, and even our awareness of time. So when that happens, we get very present with what we're doing. And when we get present, that's the moment we make circuits, we make connections. So the people who were playing the piano were so involved with what they were thinking about, so focused on what they were doing, that the thought became the experience, and the circuitry 
reflected in the brain a new mind. So when we change our mind, the brain changes. When we change our brain, we change our mind. So it's a, it's a complete cycle. So um, how does that apply to you and I? Well, if we asked ourselves, what is the greatest expression of ourself? And we sat down and began to think independent of the environment. We closed our eyes and eliminated the stimulus that we normally perceive. The brain wave patterns would begin to slow down, so much so that we would begin to relax the body enough so that the brain and body are no longer distracted. The moment that that happens, if we started to answer the question, what is the greatest expression of myself? What is the greatest ideal of myself? What would it be like to be happy? Who do I know in my life that's a happy person? What would I have to change about myself in order to live in joy? Who in history do I admire that I want to be like? If we had the patience to sit down and answer that question, we would begin to force the brain to fire in new sequences and new patterns and new combinations. And if we can make the brain fire in different combinations or different patterns, we're making a new mind, right? We're changing mind. So we can change our brain just by thinking. But you may say, well, what is that? That doesn't really change the body. How does that change the body? Well, they did another experiment where they took a group of people and they said, look, we want you to pull a spring with your finger for an hour a day for four weeks. And at the end of four weeks, people, when they tested the muscle strength of that finger, there was a 30% increase in muscle strength. Well, that makes sense, right? You put a load on a muscle, there's resistance. You continuously stress the muscle. The muscle fibers are going to break down, and it's going to grow bigger proteins so they can handle a bigger load, normal physiology. But in another group, they said, come for an hour a day for four weeks, but <clears throat> instead of actually pulling the spring, we want you to mentally rehearse pulling the spring. And at in the end of four weeks, they had a 22% increase in muscle strength. Now, they never touched the spring. So which means now, in the piano playing experiment, the brain and the mind were ahead of the actual experience of playing the piano. In other words, the brain looked like, if we looked at the brain after they did the rehearsal, the brain looked like they actually physically played the piano. So the brain was ahead of the, was ahead of the actual experience. In the finger exercise, now, 22% uh, increase in muscle strength never touched the spring. <coughs> that means now the brain and the mind and the body are ahead of the actual experience. So how does that happen? Again, the concept in neuroscience, nerve cells that fire together, wire together. You fire the same thoughts, think the same thoughts over and over again. The neurons continuously fire. They continuously fire. There comes a moment where the neurons release this chemical. It's like a miracle grow. It's like a fertilizer. It's like a glue that causes neurons to develop not only a long-term relationship with each other, but sprout more intricate connections. So now there's a more refined network of neurons, a greater capacity for mind, a greater intention, which sends a stronger signal down the central nervous system. And it's their mind that literally moves that spring. So then you say, well, it didn't change the body physically. There was no changes, physical changes in the body, but the muscle, I mean, the, but the finger was actually stronger. So they did another experiment where they took a group of men that um, uh, they asked them to come and, actually, and mentally rehearse curling a dumbbell in their mind over and over again. And at the end of the experiment, these men had a 13% increase in the size of their bicep and they never touch the weights. Now we're seeing now that through rehearsal, through the proper rehearsal, we can prepare the brain, the mind, and the body to be ahead of the actual experience. Which means then, if subjective mind is going to have an effect on the objective world, if the brain and the mind and body are reflecting the event as if the experience happened, it means in the quantum field, the experience finds us because the brain and body and mind are prepared for the experience. Now, the problem is with most people, they're so conditioned by the environment that to think without the environment, uh, they realize how conditioned their mind is 
to pay attention to the extraneous stimuli that they've been conditioned to pay attention to. So the virtual world crumbles for them, or crumbles for us, I should say, when we're distracted by stressors and events and people and things we have to do because the stream of consciousness is interrupted with our circuitry that we've developed uh, from our own poor neural habits. So the idea then is that how do we learn how to pay attention? How do we learn how to get present? How do we learn how to uh, move into a state in which the internal world is actually greater than the external world? Because if we're able to do that, the willful changes that take place, because it has to take will, it doesn't work when you're watching television or you're watching a, uh, a virtual show because there's no will involved. There has to be intention. There has to be free will involved because it's consciousness now which becomes aware of its own actions that's going to upscale the hardware of the brain. So let's talk about video gaming because uh, it's a phenomenon in our culture right now. So here's a kid, he's playing, the video, playing his video games, and every time he or she plays the video game and they blow somebody up or break through a wall or shoot something down or punch somebody or kick them or score or whatever they do, there's an amazing release of dopamine in their brain. And dopamine is the pleasure chemical. And if they're shooting and they're attacking, just like the, uh, the army uh, folks who are watching the virtual world and producing adrenaline, they're producing adrenaline or norepinephrine in their brain. So now you have the pleasure center being stimulated and you have adrenaline turning on the brain for super awareness, right? Well, you play that enough times, uh, the next time the child plays, they need a little bit more of a rush to turn on the same mechanisms. In other words, the pleasure centers in the brain recalibrate to a higher level. So now it takes more chemistry, more blowing up, more playing to produce the same physiological high. Now, that's not learning. That's associative memory. That's reacting. That's conditioning. That's impulse reaction. So now you take the kid and you bring them to school. Now learning should be a reward in and of itself. And now the child is not getting the same rush in the pleasure centers, and by the way, the pleasure centers is way higher than most kids, uh, and they're not getting the adrenal glands turned on to cause the brain to be aware and awake. So what do they do? They fall asleep or they get in trouble. And when they get in trouble, they have now a hyperactive attention deficit disorder. Well, why? Well, they're trying to produce the same chemistry so that their brain wakes up so that they can feel alive. And so the receptor sites become desensitized, and it always takes a little bit more of a rush or a little bit more chemical hit to be able to turn on those mechanisms. So what happens to the child when they're not playing video games, when they can go out and watch a sunset or walk with their grandparent or, or sit down at dinner and talk to their parents? They're aggressive, or their, their pleasure centers are so high that they begin to experience this thing called anhedonia which means you can't get pleasure from anything. And so what do they do? When they realize that nothing in their environment turns them on, they go back to gaming. Or they buy another game that's a little bit further over the top to get the same rush. And hence, you see the brain chemistry changing dramatically. And, and the quickness in the shift in attention spans actually shortens brain uh, activity in terms of the frontal lobe. And it creates kind of like a chronic distractibility where they're always distracted from one event to the next because their brain has been conditioned that way. So that's not, that's not focus. That's actually reaction. And, and, and it, it actually messes up uh, circuitry in the brain.